Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. My name is Sarah Scholl. I am the Public Relations and Outreach Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. Um, and with me today is Kurt Weinhold of Kurt Weinhold Photography. And we are going to discuss taking beautiful pictures outdoors in our beautiful state parks and forests. So welcome, Kurt. Well, hello, and thanks for having me, Sarah. Yes, thank you for being with us. So Kurt, um, while we get started, um, can you just give us a quick overview of your experience and career as a photographer? Well, I began taking pictures quite a few years ago and um, got into wedding and portrait photography. All the time I really enjoy the outdoor photography best, but the wedding and the portrait photography paid the bills. <laughs> right? And um, about three years ago, I decided I was no longer going to do wedding and portraits. And I'm just strictly doing outdoor photography. Um, I became one of the very first uh, people in Pennsylvania Wilds to become a Wilds artisan uh, back about 10 years ago and uh, participate in quite a few of the Wilds artisan programs and outdoor art shows and those sorts of things. And I just really love roving the fields and the forest for everything from animals to wildflowers to waterfalls. That's wonderful, Kurt. Now tell me, what is a wild artisan? Okay, the, the Pennsylvania Wilds has uh, what they call artisans. And what we do is go through a jury process and we have everything from photographers and painters to ceramics and woodworkers. Um, but you have to uh, submit your work and uh, then you're, you're certified as a Pennsylvania Wilds artisan. And that's all there is to it. Okay, great, wonderful, wonderful. So now, what is the biggest difference um, between taking photos indoors and outdoors? The lighting. <laughs> the lighting. Yep, it's all about the lighting. Um, I have a home studio, and I have all the uh, the big electronic flashes with the soft boxes and the umbrellas and all those things. Uh, and it's portable. I, I do the photography for our hospitals for uh, the new doctors and the PAs and so on. But um, like I said before, uh, my real passion is is outdoors and that sort of photography. So now how would someone get started taking photographs outdoors? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> First of all, you have to love the outdoors and it will show in your work. Um, and, I, and I do. Um, I started off many years ago. I was a hunter, hunter and a fisherman and um, I walk by all these all these things that I that I now can identify, especially wildflowers. I I got to know a woman who eventually became my wife. She lived on a farm. She knew the names of a lot of wildflowers, which I I never even noticed them before. So um, uh, I was I would take the pictures. I would I would uh, learn to identify them, and on and on it went. And uh, so now I, I there's an awful lot of wildflowers I do not know. But um, I tell you what, when you find wildflowers uh, from season to season, this, this spring, um, I haven't seen anything like wildflowers since last year. It's like meeting an old friend. And when you go through the woods, the fields, whatever, and you can recognize the, the trees, the birds, the animals and whatnot, it's a much, much better experience. And I don't think I would have that if it weren't for photography. It's made me a very nosy person. And, and Yep, and uh, so I, I'm I'm up sometimes early in the morning and late at late at night for the light. Um, just three mornings ago, I left the house at two fifteen in the morning. Yes, at two fifteen in the morning, my wife wasn't mad at me. No, I we had a we had a clear night, and I went to photograph the Milky Way and the and the rising moon nearby. I live fifteen miles from Cherry Springs State Park, which is very well known for dark skies. And uh, that, that's my passion. As I mentioned, the, uh, the wildflowers, the waterfalls, and the starry skies. And uh, Cherry Springs is just about the darkest place in the east to find uh, starry skies. Um, I have a workshop there. And we'll get people oftentimes from southeast Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and New York City. And um, the, the, the light pollution there is horrible. You, you don't know unless you go, but um, they come here 
and um, I show them the stars and, and their jaws just about drop. And I, I remember I uh, last year I apologized to a group. I said, this, the sky just isn't as clear as it was last night. And I'm sorry for that. They thought I was joking because they had never, ever seen the Milky Way before. And um, that, that, that just one little example of uh, just opening the eyes of people. Photography has opened my eyes, and I, I try through, uh, through attempting to take beautiful pictures and that more people will have an appreciation of the outdoors. And I think that when we appreciate something, we take care of it. I agree with that. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So now, uh, what sort of equipment does someone need to get started with outdoor photography? Well, you can start with uh, a phone camera. Uh, a lot of people use those, and uh, the latest iPhones and the Androids are very good. I, I have a, I have an Android, but um, I only use it when I just happen to have it with me and nothing else. But I'm a Nikon guy. I started with Nikon back in the days when I shot film. But let me tell you, it's a camera is a tool. And just like a carpenter has tools that he uses skillfully, but if you and I pick them up, you ain't going to have the craftsmanship that the carpenter has. And that's the way it is with a camera. Um, um, I so suppose there's exceptions, but uh, generally any camera is capable of taking a picture. Is 10% camera and 90% behind the camera. This is with any tool. Um, so I use Nikons. I have lenses that range from uh, 14 millimeters, which is an extreme wide angle, on up to 600 millimeters, which is equivalent to a 12 power binocular. And um, of course you have to know when to use which. And there's also lenses made just for close up photography. They're called macro lenses. And uh, they're, they're specialized, but you can also use those for portraits and other things as well. Uh, but there's just no end to the equipment. You, <laughs> uh, you can become equipment poor pretty quickly and tripods uh, yeah, tri tripods are another thing for night sky photography, waterfalls and whatnot. I always use a tripod um, because we have long exposures and, and, we, and a human hand can't hold a camera steady enough for exposure longer than maybe a thirtieth of a second. Sure. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I really like that you are open to the phone cameras because that is a super accessible way for people to begin photography because Pretty much almost everyone has one with a semi-decent camera and they're only getting better. So what kind of tips do you have for, for mobile photography on, on your cell phone? Oh, look for good lighting. That, that's really, really important. Um, if you're going to take a picture of, and I, and I think most people with cell phones aren't taking pictures of, of their friends, relatives, and so on. Um, don't put somebody outdoors when the sun is overhead or we get what we call raccoon eyes mm -hmm. shadows right here oh, under the too well. <laughs> so, yeah put them in the shade of a tree or building or wait for a cloud to overhead um a photographer a long time ago said that um the subject is nothing but the light is everything and that that's an exaggeration but um lighting can can make or break a picture pretty quickly and uh I learned that years ago when I had a, a course to learn portrait photography. Um, it, I learned about the lighting and you don't absolutely have to have expensive lighting equipment um, if, as long as you, you observe things and, and light them properly. But when you learn to light the human face, then you can photograph just about any, anything properly. The human face is tough. Yeah. But, Easy. Put your subject in a shady area. Good tip. Good tip. Now, is there a time of day that's best to take photographs outdoors? There definitely is. Um, morning and evening, early in the day, late in the day, um, and the different subjects will make a difference. But if I want to take a picture of our Pennsylvania Grand Canyon, I'm going to hope for a sunny day, maybe with some nice puffy cumulus clouds, and um, on the other hand, then, if I want to go into the woods and take pictures, then it's really contrasty. There's light and shadow. The trees are casting shadows, and our eyes can see into those shadows, whereas film and or digital isn't quite as good as, as, it, as our eyes. 
So, on a day that you want to take pictures in the woods um, and you want detail in the forest, look for cloudy conditions. Just the opposite of what you want for the green landscape. Uh, I've been, been in Arizona and Alaska uh, where they have some pretty green landscapes. And believe me, you want you want sunshine for that, that sort of thing. But um, you, you learn to observe the light. Um, another thing, since you brought that up, waterfalls. Um, if you photograph a waterfall on a beautiful day, um, it's going to be all full of highlights and shadows and contrast. So I'm going to give a tip that I would normally charge hundreds of dollars for. No, uh, 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 something like a waterfall, a cloudy day. Actually, a light rain is best. But miserable, miserable days make some good pictures. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the clouds can be helpful for yeah for controlling the sun, and that is pretty much the only way to control it when you're out outdoors. That's right. Yep. Trees and stuff, but yeah, they can be your friends. Um, yep. Kurt, if you wouldn't mind, while we answer some more questions, uh, let's flip through some of your um, work here, just so people can take a look at. Not that our faces aren't gorgeous, obviously, but um, just so they can get a taste of some of your work um, and okay, some good. Some, uh, breathtaking imagery here. So let me just get this. Set up. Here we go. Um, all right, I think people can okay, see this, that this there. Is, How's that looking? This is Pine Creek. Um, this is portion is in southern Tioga County, and those plants in the front are teasel. It's always interesting to put put a subject in the foreground uh, just to give a sense of depth. Yeah, absolutely, it's beautiful. What tips do you have for photographing waters and streams? Okay, um, I'll use a slow, slow shutter speed a lot of times. That means a tripod, which I mentioned earlier. If I forget the tripod, I may as well have to go back home. But uh, the, the as the water flows along, it gives a real smooth, soothing, effect and then I'll add a polarizing filter to the camera lens and um, what that does oftentimes is it will darken the blue sky and eliminate reflections that you really wouldn't see otherwise. Mm, beautiful. Now Kurt, um, sometimes <laughs> when where people are talking about photography I hear a term called golden hour. Um, is yes. that a thing um, and how would someone take advantage of that? Well, the golden hour is just a way to describe late in the day, just before the sun sets, or maybe even as the sun went down. Um, it, it's just a beautiful, beautiful light. Um, what we're looking at here is, is goldenrod, um, which, <laughs> since you mentioned golden hour, it's mm -hmm. a little bit like that. But um, the, the golden hour would be late in the day, you know, just about at, at sunset. Um, not so much to take pictures toward the sun, but um, you see how the landscape gets colored. Very nice. Yes, it's still bright, but you can tell it's a wooded area. So. Mm -hmm. the, the photo is very bright, but you can see that it's a pretty wooded area that you're in, so. And, the, and if I had shot that on a sunny day, um, there would be highlights in the golden rod and the trees would be dark. Right. Hmm. Now, what about uh, photographing wildlife? How is that different from approaching a landscape? Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to wildlife, I'm kind of an opportunist. Um, I'm not, I, I wish I were, but I'm, I'm not that great a wildlife photographer, although you might think different looking at these ospreys coming in here. Oh, but nice. I do have this nest just seven miles from the house that I go to, and this was taken right about that time of the year. Um, the Cardinal was taken right, right through the kitchen door. I'll put out a bird feeder. And then when the bird lands on a nearby limb, that's when I'll take the picture but, uh, right through the kitchen door. So you bait them a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a good tip. Yeah, chickadee the same way. And we have that going on right now. We have, uh, 
Chickadee, Juncos, we have Blue Jays, we have uh, a Red Squirrel that tries to get get the food, but um, lately we've, well, for the past two weeks, we've had uh, uh, Rose Breast at Gross Beaks. Uh, they're nice. What, what tips do you have for people that want to uh, photograph wildlife? Um, how, how do you maintain a proper distance and still respect the creatures and, you know, kind of like, but get these beautiful shots? Okay. Well, um, I would start with something that we have plenty of in Pennsylvania. That would be elk. Uh, down in the Banazette area of Elk County, um, the elk are, are uh, very used to seeing people. And that's a good place to start. Of course, you're going to need a telephoto lens, yep, just like that. That was taken in, in the fall during what's called the rut. It's the breeding season for elk, and they bugle. And uh, yeah, sometimes I, wait. Yeah, I can see this situation coming up here, and I, I moved around until I had that one elk in the antlers of the other. So there's there's times when you get lucky. Uh, but oftentimes, you plan for your luck, too. But... Um, I, I think that's a, a real easy thing for people is to travel to Ben is that it's, it's plenty busy enough down there in, uh, in the fall. It's almost as busy as a supermarket parking lot. Hmm. Yeah, it is. And the, those turkeys that we just saw, they've been coming to uh, along just outside of the town. I live, um, the people were feeding turkeys. It's illegal. Uh, the game commission does not want you to do that but it makes photographing turkeys a whole lot easier. Absolutely. So now when you're going into a park specifically to take photographs, um, what, where do you begin? Where do you even go? Do you have like a little, you know, map or plot of your, of your locations to check out? How do you approach it? Well, I live in North Central Pennsylvania, which has a lot of uh, the sort of the subjects I like. Um, and I, I know pretty well where I'm going going to go. Now, if I go traveling, um, I've, I've been to, to the Arizona Grand Canyon, and I actually backpacked um, the canyon from the North Rim to the South Rim. And it, that was all new to me. Um, but um, you learn to recognize a pretty picture. A pretty location for a picture. Um, here in my backyard, to, so to speak, um, I have plenty of places to go. Um, when the light is right, I know where I'm going to go. Uh, so certain things are blooming. But when I when I take a trip, it's a little bit different. And uh, there is some lag time. Uh, get familiar with an area. Study it. Uh, um, through the internet is the best way anymore. And uh, um, social websites, Facebook often has a lot of information on that. Pose a question. But there's, there's certainly a difference between being familiar with an area or not. Mm -hmm. Like I say, there is, there is some lag time when I travel to another area. But uh, here for those Ospreys, I know where to go, when to go. Uh, Pennsylvania Grand Canyon or the waterfalls. Um, I'll wait until we've had a, a good rain and um, travel over there on a cloudy day. I'm also an avid cross country skier and that will get me out to a lot of different places. I backpack as well. And uh, backpacking keeps you out in the morning and in the evening or as if you, uh, if you're, you're working from your home, you're more likely to to be at home in the morning and or the evening, which is really a sweet time for photography. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, look for things like this. Of course, I knew that that bench was there. I sat and drank coffee on it a couple of times, but and this was taken in September. September is a month when we have fog forming in the valleys. We have longer nights, which cause cooler mornings and the fog condenses. So those are the things you look for. Um, I'm a a weather weenie, I guess you would call mm -hmm. it. And uh, so I, I watch the weather a lot and, and plan for things that way. Great tip, great tip. Is there a season that you think is best to take for the next in? A season? Um, no, they're all good. I'm taking beautiful winter pictures and beautiful uh, summer pictures. One of my 
favorite pictures is over at the Grand Canyon. I, I remember it was the first morning of summer and there was a, a light fog in the canyon and it was just very, very, very dramatic. Uh, you know, you, you, you plan for things, sometimes you just can only attribute a uh, good picture to some good luck. <laughs> you yeah. just don't know. Yeah. yeah. And this is that bench we just saw before. Yeah, I Let's talk a little bit about um, taking photographs at night, night sky. You said that's one of your um, favorite okay. things to do, favorite subjects. So, so what, how would someone even approach their first nightscape photograph? Well, um, how they're doing it nowadays is coming to my workshops, but. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, besides that, considering besides there's no more stuff happening right All now. Right. I, I didn't, I wasn't able to go to anybody's workshop when I learned that I, I learned a lot on my own uh, backpacking to see the stars. And I thought, oh, I'll try taking these pictures. With film, it's, with film, you just can't do it. Digital is a whole different story. And uh, you definitely need a digital camera, one that will accept interchangeable lenses because. They are the ones that are adjustable. And um, almost any brand of camera that takes interchangeable lenses will work. Uh, we use a wide angle lens. We set the camera to be very sensitive to light. That's known as the ISO setting. And you, you crank that up way higher than you would for a, a daytime picture use a wide angle lens, we use a tripod for long exposure. This picture we're looking at right now is actually made from four different pictures. Um, I'm trying to see the date on that. I think it was last year, it was March, or maybe it was this year. I think it does say 2020 there, March 2020. This is a Cherry Spring Park and uh, the Milky Way is rising. The Milky Way is, is uh, well, let me see, in the, in the winter time, the Milky Way is quite faint, but now we see what's called the core of the Milky Way. If you look on the lower right-hand side of the picture, you see the Milky Way is more brilliant and dense there. And uh, that's because we're looking at the core, the center of the Milky Way. And uh, so that was rising at uh, by the time it would be given on there. I'm just not sure what it is anymore. Maybe, uh, maybe your viewers can see that, but it was about four o'clock in the morning. And um, yeah, it's it's uh it's like, oh no, it must go out there. Seventeen degrees that morning, and um, you're you're standing there with a uh, tripod mounted camera, and I will take that picture in four slices, and then in Photoshop I combine those into a single panoramic image. Mm. With our naked eye, we can't see the Milky Way quite like that. We can only see pieces of it, but the camera can assemble it. The camera gathers light and it's a lot more light sensitive than our eyes would be. Uh, it's just very interesting and and uh, I I just love night sky photography, um, especially, especially in these last uh, two months, let's let's say, it is the ultimate social distancing. Um, <laughs> nobody around. Um, occasionally I'll hear a coyote yipping. Um, last year in the summertime, it was very memorable. There were fireflies in the meadow and they were blinking off and on, almost imitating uh, the Milky Way. And then across the road, there was a, a pond I could hear frogs croaking. It was just ideal croaking frogs and flickering fireflies in the Milky Way. Okay. And those are the sort of things you, you, can't, you can't put on a picture. It's the experience. And... Uh, I've had experiences with photography that are, are just, just unique. Uh, I run over, almost got run over by a moose one time, and had a moose step into a bicycle. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been up close, closer than I wanted to be with the big Alaskan brown bears. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but this photography here, this nighttime photography, is it's just as thrilling to. Uh, you think you get a good good picture, but you really don't know until you come home and set it up and edit it on the computer. How much editing goes into your photographs? Excuse me? How much editing goes into your photographs? 
Well, I do what's shooting. Uh, a camera spits out two different types of images, or a raw image, R-A-W, and another one called a JPEG. And uh, when I shoot a raw image, I do all the editing. When you shoot a JPEG, the, uh, the brilliant minds that assemble the camera actually do the picture editing, and th they throw out a lot of information that, that you need. So I'll shoot a raw image and edit it in Photoshop. It might take me five minutes to get the first one, and then the, the succeeding images go a lot quicker. Uh, you know, here we have a uh, moon rising at, at Lyman Run State Park. But, um, editing is something that's really, really necessary if you want to get the, the utmost out of a picture. Um, some people don't want to do that. I think that's why film cameras are uh, as popular as they are. They're quick, they're easy, and they're pretty darn good for what you what you get there. But um, really, if you if depending on your if your passion is photography, um, I would say get yourself a what's called a digital SLR single lens reflex, and 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 learn and learn. There is a learning curve. Definitely is. It's not as easy as as uh, taking a picture with your iPhone and sending it to Facebook right away. Um, but the rewards are a lot a lot greater if you put some time and effort into it. Like going to college, you know, uh, it it ain't easy sometimes. There's some rough days, but um, usually the re the rewards are are, are worthwhile. What's so what we put into it? What sort of safety tips do you have for people going out to do outdoor photography? You mentioned some harrowing situations you found yourself in. Um, do you kind of have any safety practices that you follow based on your experience? Safety? Yeah. Well, I try to avoid ticks and rattlesnakes. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I understand that for a woman, a woman there's uh, some concern that men might not have uh, go out go out in a small group, um, but I've never had a problem. I've gone to some some pretty rough places. I go down into some gorges. I've never had a broken bone. I don't know why, but um, especially going after the waterfalls, you go in some some pretty tough situations. And um, my wife doesn't like to hear this, but we do just about anything for a picture. Okay, yes, <laughs> <laughs> almost. Yeah. Do you always tell someone where you're going, though, Kurt? You mentioned you'll be out at 4.30 in the morning. I do. That's a. important. Okay, I great. Do. So even if you're not waking up your wife at 2 o'clock, you'll say before no. bed, hey, I'll be out, you know. So. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's important. Let somebody know where you're going. Yes. Because um, a non-photographer, for the most part, does not want to hang out with a photographer. We're always stopping. We're always seeing things that nobody else sees. And it, it, it can be... It can be tough if you're just tagging along. Awesome, awesome. Um, now, uh, how, how did you become involved with um, the Parks and Forest Foundation? How did, how did you hook up with them? I really don't know. Um, I, I'm a, uh, in, involved at Lyman Run State Park, and um, I'm a member of what's called the Friend of Lyman Run over there. And I would I would have to say that that's pretty much the way it, it's become, uh, I've become friends with a lot of foresters as well. And um, just people who enjoy the outdoors, I've, I've made a lot of contacts uh, through photography. Wait, now, what are, you, what are your duties as a friend, as a friend group member for Lyman Run? All right, currently we are attempting to raise money to put in a playground for children. Hmm. And, um, We've raised um, a few thousand dollars now. We need about thirty thousand dollars for a playground, and um, there's a uh, because of the gas drilling, there is a bill known as Act Thirteen, and uh, the counties get a certain amount of money from Act Thirteen that they can distribute, oftentimes for recreation. So our county commissioners here in Potter County just uh, about six weeks ago awarded. Uh, Lima Run State Park, friends of Lima Run, uh, $4,000 toward that playground equipment, which can only, of course, be used for the playground equipment. Um, but, but things like that. Uh, and, and, and again, 
I wouldn't be involved with any of this stuff if it weren't for the photography. It's just uh, you get to know so many people. And uh, like it, in years ago when I photographed uh, people, weddings and whatnot, um, you get to see a lot of people, meet people, and uh, I'll see people out in the street now, and, and they have children, and oh yeah, I photographed their wedding X number of years ago. Yeah. Wow. So sweet. All right, Carol, thank you so much for your time. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now. So is there any other words of wisdom you'd like to bestow upon our viewers for, for taking excellent outdoor photographs? Well, I would suggest that people pick up a camera if you don't have one and just get outside and learn an appreciation for the outdoors and um, learn to see. Uh, photographers, artists, we see things that a lot of other people don't see. Uh, you can train yourself to do that. And uh, it makes it all worthwhile. Excellent, excellent. Um, if anyone is interested in seeing Kurt's work, his uh, uh, website is there at the bottom. So please check it out. Beautiful photographs, beautiful photographs. Um, and if we have any budding photographers in the audience, please remember that um, the Parks and Forest Foundation has a photo contest. Um, so you can learn more on our website. That URL is down at the bottom. Um, we are accepting submissions now. So get out there and get, get shooting. Um, thank you again, Kurt, for being here with us today. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that next Tuesday we'll be back with our Lunch and Learns um, on the 19th. And we'll be meeting the PPFF Board of Directors. So that's very exciting. Um, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye.